I don't see anybody else waiting in line for sandwiches, so I think we're going to start. This is a very special lunch today. Um, we have a very special visitor, but we also have the first um, speaker who is part of a very special new program, um, Robert Roberto Gilly from Bologna. He's our first participant to come to CFA as part of the new HRC uh, high, high resolution camera supported program, visitor program. Um, it began, Steve was still here with us when we began it. He actually suggested Roberto was one of our speakers, and Roberto knows him pretty well from guest work on the WFXT and Light Field X ray Telescope, and probably also from working with him and Ricardo on the Chandra Deep Field South papers from 2000 and early 2000. <coughs> Um, to honor Steve, we're going to call this new program the Steve Murray Distinguished Visitor Program. We should have, I don't know, a quarter, half a dozen to ten people spread over the year. And hopefully this will continue for at least a couple of years while there's money available to HRC. Um, the goal is to invite distinguished visitors from the United States and then also from around the world um, who have close relations with X-ray astronomy to visit CFA for up to a week to talk with people here, with people in high energy, with people throughout the observatory, hopefully people will come from MIT and other uh, institutions around the Boston area. Um, as we begin this new program, Steve had actually created a new position, as Steve is very creative in, in doing things bureaucratically, um, so he actually created a position for Akko Fulton, he created him the program director. And so I want to thank Akko for making all of this possible. And, organizing and bringing people here and writing all the letters of invitation and getting what is now a new, uh, hopefully, uh, higher level of quality food than just plain old pizza. <laughs> anyway, it's a great pleasure to introduce Roberto Gilly, who's coming with us from, from initially from Florence, where he went from 2001 to his PhD. He spent a year in Baltimore, which is where he probably began his association with X-ray astronomy, with Ricardo, with Colin Norman, um, probably with Steve Murray as well. Uh, he worked on the uh, Chandra Detail South. He's a co-author of the two papers in 2001 and two, or 2000 and 2002 um, with Ricardo, that Ricardo was the, the first author for. Um, he eventually won the contest for positions back in Italy and returned to Italy. He first went back to Florence, but then went back to what was originally his home where he got his BA in Bologna. He's published extensively in X-ray astronomy. He's done lots of studies of AGM. He's done extensive work on the origin of the X-ray background and the X-ray background synthesis. Um, his talk today is up here, and it's the physics, environment, and evolution of early supermassive black holes. <clears throat> and I give you Roberto, and we will all remember Steve as all of these talks go on. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. Thank you very much, Bill, for uh, the nice introduction. So uh, I must say that uh, I mean I have a kind of mixed feelings about this seminar because, on the one hand, I'm very happy to be here. Obviously, I mean I've been working uh, on Chandra data with Chandra data since probably 15 years. So probably I mean there's no better place to to give a seminar on that and to talk to people working on uh, on, on Chandra here. On the other hand, uh, uh, I, I feel the, the responsibility of giving a good start um, to this uh, sort of uh, seminar program that is entitled to Steve, since, as Bill was, uh, was saying, I mean, uh, he, I think he's the guy who invited me, actually, or who made my name uh, for, for this uh, seminar. So we, we worked together since 2007, roughly, especially on planning uh, X emissions like uh, the Wide Field x ray Telescope. So I know uh, him since that time. And uh, so giving a good talk uh, would be a sort of way of uh, paying him tribute uh, for what uh, we did together. So let's start uh, talking about uh, science. And uh, the topic today is uh, the physics, the environment, and the evolution of early supermassive black holes. Most of the work I'll be presenting has been done in collaboration with uh, the list of people you see here. So. Uh, what we are talking about is essentially is the beginning of uh, the black hole and galaxy coevolution. There is this fascinating scenario, ag again, that has been around uh, since probably 15 years. There are uh, evidences that uh, black holes are not simply things that reside in the center of galaxies, but they may influence the life of galaxies. There are three classic arguments, uh, 
to, uh, that lead people to talk about black hole and galaxy coevolution. One is the local scale relation. On the hand, when we have uh, the mass of the black hole, on the other hand, <coughs> we have the structural parameters of the host. Then another piece of evidence uh, is the so-called Salton argument. So the match between uh, the accreted uh, uh, mass onto black holes when you integrate, for instance, the AGN luminosity function and uh, the mass in black holes that you measure in the dormant black holes in local galaxies. And also, uh, there is a third argument that is the coincidence of the cosmic behavior of uh, black hole accretion and uh, uh, star formation over cosmic time. They share the same trend, they share the same behavior. So all these arguments uh, may uh, uh, lead the people to think that black holes have a, a, some uh, a big role in, in shaping galaxies, in shaping their evolution, because cosmic time, so the issue is trying to understand how did it all start. So pushing backwards uh, and uh, focusing on black holes, uh, one may wonder when did the first generation of black holes form, and uh, in turn one may wonder what is their origin? We have no clue yet uh, on, of, uh, about uh, the seeds that uh, uh, may grow up to 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 solar masses, black holes. There are many models. Uh, they uh, span the whole range of masses from 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6 solar masses as a starting point. But uh, still, we have no information on what is the real seeds that grow up to, those ma to the masses we measure. Then... <clears throat> Another big question we are facing is where and how these seeds could grow to those masses. Whether uh, Another question is whether the formation of the black holes is something that is uh, anticipating galaxy formation. And finally, related to all of that, uh, is uh, who essentially reunites the universe. Here you see a famous cartoon showing the evolution of, uh, of uh, the universe is the Big Bang. So across this period when the hydrogen in the universe uh, went from uh, neutral to ionized, there was something uh, that produced uh, the reionization of hydrogen, and who is responsible for that uh, is actually still, uh, uh, still debated. So black hole may also take part in that, but I will not uh, address this in the talk. So let's uh, see where we stand at the moment uh, when we talk about the most distant uh, black holes we know. So, as of October, uh, as of last month, essentially, I think I counted about uh, 86 uh, quasars that are known at redshifts uh, above uh, 5.7. This is the threshold that optical service gives you. And uh, seven of them <coughs> uh, happens to be at redshift above 6.5. These come from near infrared surveys. So this, uh, all these objects uh, come from wide area uh, surveys. You see some of them listed here. Obviously, the, one of the main actors is the Sloan. There is pan stars going on. Then uh, I was mentioning infrared surveys like Euclid, for instance, Vista Byte, King, and many others. And here you see <coughs> the distribution in redshift of the objects uh, that are <coughs> above 5.7 coming from the different surveys. So the Sloan main survey and pan stars are those wide area surveys that can trace the brightest, the most luminous, and even the most massive systems uh, at ratio 6 uh, and above. These are the typical luminosities and bolometric and the absolute magnitude of the systems. Other surveys that are uh, smaller in area, they go deep to magnitude, can obviously sample uh, fainter and smaller uh, systems. Just to give you an example of what was collected uh, in terms of black hole spectra above six, uh, ratio 6 in 2012, I put this uh, figure from FAN showing everything uh, as I said, above redshift of six uh, known at, the, at that time. Now this list has uh, expanded uh, significantly. So redshift six quasars uh, uh, are rare. That's why we need a very large area survey. The density on the sky of the brightest systems is this one. They are about one every 500 square degrees. If you go down in luminosity or in magnitude, uh, you measure this density, one over 40 square degrees at the magnitude of, of uh, 20 seconds in Z-band. So you really need uh, surveys uh, as large as thousands or uh, several thousands of square degrees to be able to, to get uh, statistically sound samples of uh, such objects. And then, <clears throat> based on these surveys, you can convert these measurements uh, into a, a space density, a volume density, 
and uh, get the abundance of uh, early quasars. And what you observe is that uh, they are rare indeed, and uh, the measurement you get is that uh, you have about one object uh, per moving uh, gigaparsec. So they are extremely rare systems. And here <clears throat> we, I show the evolution of, bright, of the brightest quasars from Sloan, from uh, local universe to Rashi 6, and you see that the, essentially there is this decline in the space density of uh, bright systems that uh, roughly is about uh, one order of magnitude decreasing abundance uh, if you go from redshift 3 to redshift 5, essentially. So these are rare systems, uh, and as I was uh, hinting, these are also massive systems. These are uh, very massive objects. In this plot, you can see the volumetric luminosity versus uh, the black hole mass for uh, the entire population of Sloan quasars that is shown here in this uh, gray uh, ellipses. And uh, <clears throat> in blue and in red, uh, you see quasars at redshift of six uh, found in Sloan and in the Canada France uh, high redshift survey. So you see that uh, uh, essentially all of them or most of them lie along this line here that corresponds to the editor luminosity. And uh, if you see the mass range they span, they go from 10 to the 8 uh, up to even above 10 to the 10. This is the most massive object uh, that was found. It's a recent discovery. Uh, it was discovered uh, earlier this year. And uh, it's a slow quasar at redshift of 6.3. So the, the story about this object is that at the beginning of, of the Sloan, this object was discarded in the selection of quasars because it was too bright. So this has Z of 18. So people thought, uh, even Fan himself thought it was a star, and the student essentially reselected it uh, later on. And eventually it came out as the brightest and most massive uh, black hole uh, known at the trashes. And also here I was marking the most distant uh, object uh, uh, black hole known so far, ULAS uh, J1120, that is the record holder for redshift and is redshift of 7.08. So they're rare, they're massive, <clears throat> and the, the uh, long-standing challenge that uh, theory has to face is uh, how it is possible that these systems uh, are so big uh, in a, such a short time. Six, uh, uh, redshift six corresponds to roughly one giga year, uh, so the universe is only one giga year at that time. So it is difficult, apparently, to be able to grow uh, um, uh, uh, small black holes to, do, to that mass in, in, in a short time. Um, as I said, uh, there are um, seed <coughs> theories that start from small mass black holes. They start from uh, 100 uh, solar masses black holes. And uh, as, as you see in this plot, where you see the black hole mass as a function of redshift, uh, and these tracks uh, <clears throat> show what is the growth history of black holes starting from sm small seeds. You see that uh, to go from 100 solar masses to 10 to the 9 a billion or a few billion solar masses by redshift of 6, uh, you need uh, to accrete at the Eddington limit uh, essentially without uh, any interruption. So for one, for one giga year. So this is thought to be challenging. Uh, one possibility of avoiding this is essentially uh, to jump start from bigger black holes, so start, for instance, from direct large black holes that have been postulated to start from 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 6 solar masses. So if you start, uh, obviously, if you start for a mass that is about two or, two or three orders of magnitude larger, then you can relax uh, your assumption about uh, the Eddington limit to grow to these massive masses by redshift of 6. But there is another possibility that uh, was put forward to save uh, uh, small seeds uh, as a viable origin for uh, supermassive black holes, and is that uh, uh, early black holes are facing uh, uh, phases of uh, superediton accretion. These systems uh, are thought to uh, accrete at very high rates. If you accrete at very high rates, then the slim disk solution by Shakura Sunaiva is no more accurate. Uh, you go to other solutions that are called slim disk, and uh, in that case, uh, uh, essentially, your flow becomes radiatively inefficient. So what happens uh, is that uh, epsilon, the parameter that uh, uh, describes the radiation efficiency, goes far below 0.1. And if you plug it uh, in this uh, formula that gives you the Salpeter time for the growth of the black hole, essentially, you squeeze uh, the growth time by a factor 
of uh, several. So <clears throat> this is a plot by, uh, in a paper by Pierre Modau. You see here the black hole mass, uh, again, versus redshift, uh, starting from 100 solar masses. And you see that uh, with a few episodes of super neutron <laughs> accretion, uh, they do not have to be, uh, I mean, uninterrupted. Uh, you can uh, go to 10 to the 9 solar masses by a shift of 7. So this is another possibility to get uh, the masses we see uh, uh, in such distant objects. So people also try to see whether uh, there is a way, for instance, uh, from X-ray spectra, to uh, indirectly uh, infer uh, large accretion rates and uh, 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 see whether uh, super internal accretion is at work. So in particular, large accretion rate essentially produce, uh, uh, make the disk to, uh, to produce uh, a, a lot of photons. So the electrons in the corona uh, undergo fast uh, cooling, and this is uh, producing, in turn, a steep slope of the X-ray spectrum. This is essentially what uh, is the interpretation, for instance, for uh, objects like narrow line cipher to ones in the, in the local universe. So observing steep spectra with gamma greater than 2, for instance, significantly greater than 2, may point to super Eddington rates, and then it could make uh, uh, um, stellar size uh, seeds uh, as a viable uh, origin for, for supermassive quasar. And another feature that could be uh, uh, detected in principle uh, and that could uh, point towards uh, super Eddington accretion is the a detection of uh, uh, iron lines, uh, <clears throat> K-alpha line from highly ionized ions, because when accretion rates are large, one expects that the upper layers of the accretion disk are highly ionized. So this, again, is observed in the line cipher to ones. Uh, uh, unfortunately, at the moment, we do not have uh, sufficient quality in the X-ray spectra of redshift six quasars to get uh, these measurements. And I say for the moment because probably there is a hope uh, that I'll talk to you later on. At the moment, uh, what uh, people have measured are slopes uh, like uh, this one shown here. This is in the XMN spectrum of uh, EULAS J1120 at Rashi 7. And uh, as you see from this chi-square plot here, the photon index uh, that was <coughs> measured by this group is about uh, 2. When you plot uh, this measurement uh, uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in a context uh, of uh, objects at different redshift, you see that uh, the measurements uh, of the photon index uh, in Sloan quasars, for instance, from 1 to 5 is around 2. And as you move to targets at higher redshift, again, there is no big difference uh, with respect to what we see at low redshift. There was a claim uh, earlier, uh, I mean, uh, one year ago, that. Uh, uh, this particular object could have uh, as slope as steep as 2.6. This is work by Page, pointing, as I said, towards uh, large accretion rates. But then uh, uh, this work, which is based on the same data, found uh, a different slope. There might be background issues and background subtraction issues, but probably, I mean, uh, this value is, is highly uncertain. And uh, please have a look at this object here, at, as she 6.3 that has 2.1, and that we will discuss uh, better uh, later on. So uh, the known early, early supermassive black holes uh, are big, uh, 10 to the 9 solar masses. The hosts uh, uh, of these objects uh, uh, have masses around 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12. I'm not showing nothing about that. And then this points uh, towards uh, Dark matter halos hosting these systems as, ma as massive as 10 to the 12 or 10 to the 13 solar masses. We saw that they are rare, so the abundance is one per cubic gigaparsec cube, per cubic gigaparsec, and uh, just by making abundance matching, this is exactly the abundance of uh, dark matter halos as, masses, as massive as 10 to the 13 solar masses <coughs> at redshift of 6. And this is for a duty cycle of 1. Instead, if we assume, for instance, that the duty cycle is, is, is 3%, then this means that for every quasar we see, there are 30 black holes that, that we do not see. So their abundance is 30 times uh, this one. And uh, the dark matter halos that uh, are supposed to host uh, such an abundant population doesn't decrease its mass because the, uh, mass, uh, the bright <coughs> end of the mass function of halos is pretty steep. So even multiplying the abundance by a factor of 30, 
the mass of the dark matter halos goes down by a factor of 2, so 5 times two, 10 to the 12. They're big, they're rare, and they're also likely highly biased. We do not have measurements of the clustering of these systems at redshift 6 because the samples are too small. We have only measurements up to redshifts of 4. So here you see the bias of quasars. In gray, you see Sloan quasars, optically selected quasars. The colors show X-ray selected populations, but I mean, we do not care about that at the moment. So the bias tells you how much a population is clustered with respect uh, to dark matter. And uh, if you look at the behavior that quasars have, you see that the bias is increasing with redshift uh, from redshift 0 up to redshift 4, which is the most distant uh, redshift bin where we have uh, measurements. And uh, uh, this is also confirmed uh, by a paper that is in preparation by, by Viola Levato on the Cosmos Legacy project that uh, shows that uh, <clears throat> even objects that are probably one order of magnitude uh, less luminous than, than Sloan quasars, again, seems to be heavy, highly biased at redshift uh, above 3. So what is important to note here are these lines uh, here that you see, and these are the biases uh, for populations of dark matter halos of fixed mass. So if you consider, for instance, this gray curve here, this is the curve you expect for halos of 10 to the 13 solar masses. So it increases with redshift, and apparently the data are distributed <coughs> along this line, which, if you extrapolate to redshift 6, may again tell you that uh, big the, the, the quasars at redshift 6 we know from Sloan, for instance, reside in dark matter halos of this mass. 10 to the 12.5, 10 to the 13. So presumably, high redshift quasars live in the highest uh, peaks uh, of the density field at that redshift, and we see whether it will be able to, to, to say something on, on this particular topic. I just want to uh, remark that this is, part of this is work by Nico Capelluti, a postdoc in Bologna, who has just moved to Yale. So we have probably indirect evidences that uh, quasars are uh, uh, living in high-density peaks uh, at redshift 6. There is also support uh, to this statement from simulations. This is a simulation by Thiago Costa last year, and what you see here, these are two regions uh, of uh, uh, the simulation box uh, that are centered on an overdense region here and on an, the average density region here. So it is clear, that, at least in this simulation, that uh, the formation of uh, black holes that you see here as little dark uh, dots, uh, and the size of these dots is proportional to the mass of the system. So this is, <clears throat> for instance, 10 to the 8 uh, solar masses, which is comparable to what uh, has been measured uh, from Sloan, for instance. So you see that uh, the formation of uh, and the accretion of black holes is efficient uh, in uh, overdense environments. In the average density field, uh, you do not see such an abundant uh, population of objects. So if this is true, and if uh, quasars do live in overdense environments, then one may hope uh, to find galaxy, over galaxy and AGN overdensities around them. And this is indeed uh, what people have tried to look for for many years. And uh, the, the, the prime instrument that was used to, 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 for this research was uh, HST-ACS, for instance. So most searches uh, are based on, on this uh, instrument. This is the field of view of ACS, so it's 3 by 3 arc minute, which corresponds to 1 by 1 physical megaparsec at a shift of 6. This is a recent work. You see the a composite image. This is a HS, uh, ACS plus uh, with C3. And uh, this group here has tried to map uh, the density of Lyman break galaxies at redshift 7 around uh, the most distant quasar known. They selected three systems here, but eventually what they found is that the density of Lyman break galaxies in this field is similar to what uh, uh, is observed in blind sky field. So they have no real uh, uh, information about uh, the, the environment. I want to stress that this is one physical megaparsec, and this may be the reason why uh, 
former studies are, have been unsuccessful in detecting overdensities. Simulation indeed uh, uh, say that uh, um, overdensities of, of galaxies around uh, uh, the most massive halos at Redshift 6 may extend to much larger scales. So this is a, <clears throat> a simulation by over Z in 2009. Uh, this uh, uh, little box here shows the position of the Redshift 6 quasar in the, in the simulation. And all these dots here show uh, dropout galaxies associated to the structure within which the quasar form. So if you plot uh, on top of that uh, the ACS field of view, that is one physical megaparsec, you see that uh, essentially you miss most uh, of the structure. You also see that uh, the structure is very asymmetric, is everything but uh, a random distribution around the quasar. And uh, if you do some statistics based on uh, several plots like this one, you get that uh, the overdensity as a function of radius uh, goes like this in different uh, overdense fields, and that uh, the field remain overdense uh, up to radii that are like 30 arc minutes uh, that correspond to 10 physical megaparsec uh, at redshifts of 6. So much larger scales than what uh, uh, people have sampled with, with the ACS so far. And on top of that, I mean, there might be feedback effect uh, I'll, take, I'll, I'll talk uh, later on that may also affect the number of objects in the close vicinity of the quasar. So what we try to do is to go for larger uh, um, field of view instruments. Uh, in particular, we use the, the LBC camera at the large binocular telescope that has a field of view of 25 by 25 arc minute. So it's <clears throat> much larger than that. We observed uh, four quasars, uh, selected from the Sloan, with mass above 10 to the 9, <clears throat> solar masses. And essentially, we performed observations in the R band for three hours and uh, on the I mean, twin mirror of LBT, 1.5 hour in I and 1.5 hour in Z band. We were able to reach this sensitivity limit, Z band 25, I band uh, 27 and R28, uh, and the goal was to be able to efficiently select uh, Lyman break galaxies at redshift 6 that might be part of the same structure where the quasar reside. So this is the image, one of the four images, uh, color images that uh, we put together with LBT. So again, this is 25 on the side, the quasar is in, is in here, and uh, uh, we used the uh, the R, I, Z band images to select uh, I band dropouts, so Lyman break galaxy candidates at RC6, and a few of them are shown in this uh, inset. So this is R, I, and Z. You see that our candidates are uh, not detected in R, they start to be seen in I, and they appear bright objects in the Z band, which is what you expect for distant uh, systems, for instance. So to be more precise, this is the actual selection in each of the four fields. So this is the I minus Z color versus R minus Z colors. And we selected the samples of primary and secondary candidates using this criteria. So essentially everything that was redder than 1.3 was select, uh, selected as a dropout. And these in red are the most promising dropouts, that, uh, those that have a sharper color cut that we call primary candidates. So we performed the selection and uh, we looked uh, at uh, where these objects lie on the field of view uh, around the quasars. So these are the four fields, uh, the four LBC fields, uh, and uh, at the center you see the quasar position here in, uh, in, uh, in magenta, and uh, this little uh, blue square shows the position of existing uh, HST data. So you see again that the dimension uh, is really something different. In red, you see the primary dropouts. In blue, you see the secondary dropouts. And you see the distribution they have across the fields. You see that uh, it, it, apparently this is not uh, a random distribution. Particularly, if you look at this field here, you see that there is a concentration of dropouts uh, in the southern part of the field. And if we run some you know, statistical test to see the significance of the asymmetries, we end up with something that is in between 2.5, 3 sigma. So, the distribution of these uh, objects appear to be asymmetric that might be uh, consistent with what uh, we saw earlier 
from the simulations. The thing to do now is try to quantify uh, whether these objects uh, are really associated with the galaxy over density, so we have to measure the density of the dropouts in the field and compare with the density of the dropouts uh, in a reference field that has to be chosen uh, accurately. So we choose the Subaru X-ray Deep Survey. We perform all sorts of correction to um, be able to perform a fair match between our data and uh, the Subaru data. And uh, what matters here is this column. If you look at the table, this is essentially the number of dropouts uh, that have to be considered in the four fields. And this is the average number that is expected uh, in uh, a field uh, that is as large as, uh, as one of, of our fields. So we also try to estimate the significance of the overdensity. You see that these numbers are larger than this, performing, uh, I mean, taking account for cosmic variance and photometric errors. And uh, essentially, we end up with a distribution, a probability distribution for uh, a random field uh, sample that is like this, that picks at about four objects uh, as an average, and the measure of dropouts we have in the four fields instead is shown like these, uh, uh, these uh, um, dotted curves here. So you see that uh, there is one clearly overdense field here, there's another field that is overdense, these two we do not know really. But anyway, by combining together the fields and comparing with the reference frame, we get a combined significant uh, of the overdensity of about uh, four sigma, which is at the moment probably the, the, the most significant measurement uh, of overdensities around, uh, around quasars. So the obvious step to do afterwards is to go for spectroscopy. All those are candidates, galax candidate galaxies. We are, in, uh, we are getting spectroscopy again with the LBT, multi-object spectroscopy that is in progress. And we are starting to see some candidates at high redshift. So, for instance, this is a primary dropout that we observed uh, in this field here. The, if we interpret this as Lyman alpha, even shown here, uh, then the redshift of this uh, dropout is 5.9. If we compare this number with the redshift of the quasar, then delta Z is 0.3. That corresponds roughly to a radial separation of uh, 18 physical megaparsecs. So, this may be even uh, too far away from the quasar to be associated with the same large scale structure. Maybe a foreground object, uh, we have to I mean, uh, go further in, uh, in, in the analysis. This is a secondary dropout candidate that uh, uh, looking at this feature here, or the continuum here, and of the, at, at the null continuum here, it can be identified as a, a galaxy at redshift 5.7. And here is probably the best candidate we have so far in the field of this famous quasar, as the SRJ1148 at redshift of 6.4. And uh, the dropout that we uh, observed here, and for which we obtain this line measurement that uh, can be Lyman alpha. So if uh, uh, we interpret this like Lyman alpha, the redshift of this dropout is 6.4, roughly, 4.56. And again, uh, if we try to compute the actual separation from the quasar, it turns out to be of about four physical megaparsecs from the quasar. So this is well within uh, uh, the size uh, of the overdensity that are predicted by the simulation. So probably this could be something that is part uh, of the same large-scale structure where the, the quasar reside. We have uh, <coughs> also tried to, to perform other tests on the distribution of objects in the fields. And uh, for instance, we computed the, the uh, radial distribution of the dropout from the central quasars combining all the four fields. We, have, we get this histogram here, the solid line here. And uh, if we compare with something uh, that is expected for a random distribution across the fields, uh, we could see that there is a sort of uh, little uh, gap here, little deficit here. <laughs> Is not significant. Uh, Kolmogorov zero tells you that the distributions are only uh, different at 2.4 sigma level. But we have data, uh, deeper, in particular deeper imaging, to go one magnitude uh, uh, further down and uh, increase the statistics and try to verify whether this is real or not. 
in principle, this lack of object here could be associated uh, to the feedback effects produced by Quasar. Quasar has several ways to produce feedbacks uh, on, on their environment. For instance, they <clears throat> produce radiative feedback. The typical uh, ionization spheres around them are a few megaparsec. And they also produce uh, strong winds. In, the, in this famous object, J1148, I mean, winds uh, uh, traced by, for instance, atomic carbon, so uh, winds uh, um, that uh, consist of atomic gas has been traced uh, up to 30 kiloparsec scales. You see here the map. You see that the emission is clearly extended as compared uh, to the resolution of the observation. And all these uh, features here, it uh, correspond to outflowing gas uh, that, I mean, as I said, can reach up to a few tens of kiloparsec scales. On top of that, there may be feedback by stellar winds that uh, I mean I will not discuss. Uh, I will not discuss at the moment. So we are going uh, further <clears throat> with the, the observation. We have uh, several data programs uh, that are uh, coming along. Uh, I mean the spectroscopy is in progress. We have additional imaging that is also in progress. Uh, we also have near <clears throat> infrared imaging on the same fields to refine the selection of the dropouts. Uh, we have even uh, obtained uh, near-infrared uh, spectroscopy on a few dropout candidates uh, in one field. And finally, this is the most recent uh, uh, achievement. We also have uh, X -ray. we will also have X-rays on one of these fields, in particular on the field of J1030. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit more about uh, about this. Essentially. This is a large uh, program that has been uh, approved uh, in the last Chandra cycle, 17. So we were granted uh, 500 kilosecond uh, ACSI on uh, this uh, particular quasar field, J1030, which is the densest uh, of the field uh, we, we, we studied. So we had uh, uh, essentially three different goals uh, for this program. You see them listed here. They are sorted by decreasing risk. Uh, maybe they are even sorted by decreasing scientific interest, but anyway, so the, the main goal, the main goal, the more risky one was trying to detect uh, a number of satellite IGN in the field of view of this quasar down to these luminosities. And uh, if we compare the um, number of objects we can detect, it is probably between zero and six, uh, this number can tell you uh, something about the growth uh, of supermassive black holes in early large scale structures. Uh, depending on uh, the effect of the feedback from the quasar itself and also from the feedback by supernovae winds associated to galaxies in the upper density, you have a different prediction that you made on AGN fueling that you may try to uh, trace by detecting uh, AGN in this field. And uh, based on the characteristics of uh, these three objects in the optical, we may expect that these three are objects that will be detected in X-rays. So the second goal is to derive a high-quality X-ray spectrum of the quasar itself. We expect to get about 500, 600 counts based on existing data from XMM. And the quality of the spectrum should be sufficient to give a reliable measurement of gamma, so of the photon index, to see whether there are uh, ionized iron features uh, in the spectrum, possibly measure the presence of uh, ultra-fast outflows. And uh, in here you see an archival XMM spectrum of the quasar where there was a hint of an iron line with the rest frame energy of 6.7 keV. And uh, in 500 kilosecond uh, SSI observation, you should expect a, a quality like this one and again, we should be able to uh, fix uh, with the decent errors the, the energy of, of the line. And the final <clears throat> scientific goal uh, that probably I mean, is less relevant now that uh, we have many multi-wavelength surveys available to date is to obtain uh, something like a moderately deep survey uh, for which uh, uh, each of the 2,000 X-ray sources we expect to detect uh, uh, we'll have uh, a, a counterpart uh, at optical and uh, near infrared wavelengths. Indeed, uh, this field here, it's part of the music survey, the, um, 
it's uh, the acronym for uh, multi-wavelength uh, um, survey by Yale and Chile, something like this. And uh, as you see here, there is full coverage from the U band uh, even to IRAC and, uh, and the MIPS band. So really, it will be possible not to waste, uh, I mean, any single photon uh, of, uh, of the observation. So, I spoke uh, so far about uh, the most distant object we know, the brightest and most distant. Now, we have to try to explore another space, another parameter space, uh, uh, and probably try to search for the most abundant population of objects in the distant universe, which are the faint and obscured IRAGN. And obviously, X-ray is, 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 is the way to, to, go, to go after them. Then, unfortunately, <clears throat> we are not the same, in the same position as uh, optical and, uh, and near infrared surveys are. Uh, here is a recap showing uh, the limiting flux versus uh, the area that you can cover uh, with the, the available surveys to date. So, current surveys are shown here as little dots. You may recognize some of the famous ones. Cosmos Legacy is here, the 4 megasecond channel if you south is here. The archival, the whole archival uh, XMM and, and Chandra um, data are, are, are shown here. And <clears throat> each of these uh, uh, dotted lines here shows the number of uh, Redshift 6 uh, quasar you would expect uh, uh, um, along, uh, along this line. So if your survey, is, survey fall along this line, you would expect a point one uh, Redshift 6 object. If your survey is along here, you would expect one. If a survey is along here, you would expect 10, and so forth. So you see that essentially everything that is available <clears throat> now is probably um, uh, delivering uh, less than one uh, Redshift 6 object per survey. Maybe if you combine everything together, you get some, but still you get the, the message that uh, the current surveys are not really effective to study the, the most distant uh, AGM population. At the moment, uh, really, we do not have any X-ray selected AGN with spectroscopic redshift greater than 5.7, and also we don't even have uh, any obscured AGN uh, beyond uh, this limit. So for X-rays, at the moment, uh, it's probably better to move uh, to somewhat lower redshifts. So let's see what can be done, for instance, uh, uh, up to redshift of, of 5. So, as I said, the power of X is that you can detect uh, obscured systems. In particular, uh, if you use deep exposure like the Formex Echo Channel, if you south, it turns out that you can even trace Compton thick uh, observed quasars up to a redshift, uh, up to redshift of about five. This is something we published a few years ago. This is the spectrum, <coughs> the Chandra, the, the Formex Echo Channel spectrum of uh, XID. For three, for those who are familiar with this uh, numbering scheme, and uh, this spectrum is featuring a color density of 10 to the 24 and above, and a luminosity that qualifies it as a quasar. So it's a competitive quasar at ratio of about five. Fortunately, the quality of the data is robust, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, Compton thick nature of this system and uh, the quasar nature of the system hold, both hold, if we uh, uh, analyze the six megasecond data. You see them here in red, and uh, by the end of this year, the final seven megasecond exposure of the field should be completed. So by the end of the year, it will be possible to perform the definitive uh, spectral analysis uh, for sources like this one. And uh, <clears throat> I'd like to acknowledge uh, the contribution by Fabio Vito, who essentially extracted uh, and produced the, the spectrum uh, of, this, uh, of this source in the section like a second data. He is now at uh, Penn State. We also got, uh, uh, for this particular object, uh, a follow-up with ALMA. And uh, ALMA can be used uh, to get information on the gas and on the dust content of the host galaxy, for instance. So. <clears throat> This is uh, our ALMA data. It's just a simple detection, even if it's very significant. It's about 30 sigma. And here is the far infrared uh, SED of this object. And if you fit it, uh, like for instance using a, a black body component, 
then <clears throat> you can get uh, the temperature of the dust that is about 50 degrees, and also you can get the mass of the dust that is something 10 to the 8 uh, solar masses, and also based on the uh, high resolution of the ALMA uh, imaging, you can estimate uh, that uh, uh, the half-light radius of the dust is about uh, one kiloparsec. So the interesting thing uh, with these measurements uh, is, is the following. Uh, by, by using other data, we have an estimate of uh, how much gas is in the host. And the total amount of mass, gas mass, is about uh, 10 to the 10 uh, solar masses. So if we squeeze all these gas mass within this area, then we expect a column density in the ISM of the host that is of the order of 0.31, 10 to the 24. So you see that it's comparable with X-rays. And on top of that, we know that uh, the interstellar medium of this uh, object uh, has solar metallicity. This is again work by, by Torna Gao. So uh, an intriguing possibility is that uh, this system is so compact that the ISM is actually what is producing, uh, maybe not all, but a significant part of the X-ray obscuration. So uh, how, how long should I talk? Five minutes? Seven more minutes, okay, I think, <laughs> I think I'm fine. <laughs> so based on, uh, again, based on uh, the, the full maker second data and on the deep survey, uh, combining objects uh, like the one I showed earlier with other obscured and unobscured AGN at high redshift, uh, people can build AGN luminosity functions uh, <clears throat> up to redshift of, uh, let's say, five at the moment. Uh, this is work by Fabio, there are even more recent works. Uh, and you see here that essentially this is the limit that we, that we can achieve nowadays. So 10 to the 44 at redshift of about 4. What is interesting uh, and is coming out of this work is that uh, the, dense, the, the space density of AGN down to this limit of 10 to the 44 essentially has the same behavior of uh, the brightest uh, Sloan quasar that I showed you earlier. So this is the <clears throat> redshift behavior of the density that you see here with this black curve. So there is a one order of magnitude decrease in the density from redshift 3 to 5, and this is exactly what has been seen for luminous uh, systems. So at the moment, there is no evidence uh, based on the data that uh, low uh, luminosity, low mass probably systems evolve in a different way than bright systems. As I said, X-rays are wonderful to trace uh, obscured systems, and again, based on the deep surveys, we can compute the obscured AGN fraction as a function of luminosity, and this is the measure <clears throat> we get at redshift of 3.5 that tells you that about uh, half of the AGN at redshift above 3 are obscured by column densities in excess of 10 to the 23 centimeters to the minus 2. And when we compare the measurement at redshift 3.5 with the redshift of zero, what we see in the local universe, we immediately see that especially towards high luminosity, there has been an increase of the obscurity GM fraction as you move to higher and higher redshift. This was also suggested <clears throat> earlier on. We want to speculate here that uh, this enhanced fraction may be uh, due to the fact that uh, the host uh, of uh, this object uh, contain a higher gas fraction than uh, the host of local systems, and then also the size, the average size of galaxies is uh, squeezing as you go to high redshift, so the density of the ISM should increase on average when you go to high redshift. And so the intriguing possibility is that part of this behavior here, but part of this increase, is indeed uh, produced by the contribution uh, of the interstellar medium absorption. We propose for uh, further ARMA observations uh, of other objects to see whether this is the case, so to compare the density of the ISM with the density you measure in the X-rays, we now have uh, fillers, so five uh, obscure ADN at redshift greater than 2.5, which are, well, are not scheduled, are considered as fillers. It means like uh, C targets in XMM, if you are familiar with, the, with this scheme. So there is no guarantee that it will be observed, but it would be nice, I mean, to get uh, some uh, statistics uh, for, uh, for this kind of, of, of problem. So in the last five minutes I have, I will 
try now to, to, to say something about the prospects for future X-ray survey facilities about the detection of uh, the most distant uh, AGN. So in this slide here, you, you see a comparison between what uh, is available now, Chandra and XMM, uh, launched both in 1999, with uh, what will be available in the near, uh, mid-term, and also far, uh, far future. So the, <clears throat> the first one that will probably come to reality is Erosita. It is scheduled for launch in 2017. Then, uh, as you know, there is the Athena mission that has been approved by ESA as a, its a second large mission, and uh, it should be launched around 2028. And then there are, at the moment, uh, mission concepts, uh, uh, like, for instance, the WFXT, that I know quite well, and also uh, probably the one uh, that uh, people here is, is uh, more active, and it is the concept of the X-ray surveyor. So I listed here some uh, parameters that are featuring uh, each of these missions, and uh, I put in red here, in, uh, sorry, in green here, the, the best uh, value uh, for each of the parameters. So as far as the effective area is concerned, you see that Athena and the access surveyor are planned to have about two square meters of effective area at one kV. The field of view, <coughs> instead, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, the, the idea is to have the largest field of view on this mission, WFXT, and also in turn, if you make the product between these two quantities, which is the grasp, which is the survey speed, essentially this mission is uh, uh, probably the fastest uh, in, in doing that. The feature of access surveyor, obviously, is that uh, uh, it is planned to have uh, sub arc second resolution across uh, a pretty large area. So it is planned to have uh, a quality of the image, uh, not only as comparable to Chandra at the aim point, but much better than Chandra when you consider the average PSF across the field of view, so 1.5 versus 3 arc second, for instance. And uh, if we uh, try to put uh, surveys that can be done with these instruments uh, on the same plot that I showed earlier, <coughs> you see them, <coughs> you see this feature mission in colors, and you immediately see that Erosita is up here, so it will sample something that is uh, above 10 to the minus 15 in flux, uh, and essentially Erosita will detect uh, Treshif 6, the same objects uh, that Sloan is detecting. It will be the same kind of thing. Uh, this is what uh, is being foreseen for Athena, one medium deep uh, and one deep uh, survey. The number of objects you would expect uh, to get with these two surveys is something like uh, between 10 and 100, according to these particular curves that obviously are based on a specific model. This is what you would expect uh, <clears throat> for a mission like uh, WFXT, that is a nominal duration of five years, and it was originally structured in three surveys distributed like this. And as you see, if you can cover these big areas down to these flux limits, then you expect uh, to detect in five years something like 2,000 AGN at ratio to about six, uh, and importantly, about half of them will be obscured. Uh, we don't know any of them now. And 70 of them are expected to lie at redshift above eight. Then I put here for comparison uh, a possibility for a one-year survey with the excess surveyor, which obviously can go deeper because of the PSF. And uh, uh, in one year, I mean, it, can detect something between something like a few hundred of AGN down to this uh, limiting flux. So in particular, these three missions here will be great because they could trace uh, obscured and unobscured AGN at redshift of six, measure the luminosity function, and also measure the clustering, so the bias. And as a final, uh, as a final remark, I would like to compare uh, what uh, um, uh, what are the detection capabilities of X-ray surveys with the detection capabilities of multiband uh, surveys, optical and near infrared in particular, uh, as far as high redshift are concerned. So, for instance, uh, by considering here obscure AGN at redshift 6 and above, assuming a typical LCD, I don't know, Elvis or uh, something uh, similar, for instance, uh, one can uh, transform uh, 
the, detach, the, the flux limit uh, in each band into a volumetric, lum, volumetric luminosity limit uh, in each band. So here you see <coughs> volumetric luminosity versus area. Here again you see the curves that are based on uh, a specific model prediction, 1, 10, 100 object ratio above 6. And here in color you see the situation that is uh, expected for the next generation surveys in the optical and in the near infrared. So, as you immediately see, you see that uh, uh, in principle there are surveys like uh, Euclid LSST W first uh, that can even provide a larger number of AGN than uh, uh, what could be uh, achieved with the, with the future access surveys with WFXT, Athena, perhaps a surveyor. But the interesting thing is that uh, if you move from this computation that is done for an obscure AGN to a similar computation for obscure AGN, then you see that, uh, I go back and forth between these two slides, what you can see is that, uh, for instance, this uh, near infrared service limit go up by more than an order of magnitude. And the reason is that, essentially, in these bands, uh, optical and uh, uh, near infrared, uh, at redshift 6, you will be sampling uh, the UV light. And so the extinction will kill every uh, single photon produced by the agent. So what you will be essentially seeing at this wavelength uh, will be the host galaxy. And this will <clears throat> obviously uh, mm, reduce dramatically your capability of detecting obscure AGN. So if we now have a look uh, at the match between the future facilities and uh, the X-ray survey facilities, it is clear that there is a perfect match And on top of that, it is clear that uh, whatever can be identified as a high redshift galaxy in this service, by coupling those measurements with X measurement, you get immediately the flag of where an obscure AGN at, at that redshift uh, might be. And so that would be, you know, a perfect uh, tool to detect uh, such systems. I think uh, I run out of time. Uh, so if that is true, I can leave you with a summary and uh, take questions if there are any. Thank you. I think Steve would have been pleased. Thank you. Um, I wasn't clear on what those dotted lines that said 110, 100 are. Those are supermassive black holes at redshift 6 or larger? Yeah. So, and by supermassive, you mean greater than 10 to the 9 solar mass, or what? It's, uh, well, the, the mass scale, it's, uh, it's here. Well, the mass scale is on the right. So, <clears throat> obviously, I mean, the conversion is done assuming uh, one, lambda editon of one. And so, the mass scale, uh, you see here, you go from 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 10, Solar masses, uh, if uh, they are radiating at the identical limit, otherwise, you know, the, the scale will go up uh, by some factor. But this means that, uh, yeah, you would be able to detect uh, 10 to the 6 uh, solar mass black hole uh, at redshift 6 and beyond uh, if you have instruments like this, like this, like this. So is there a luminosity function of, as a function of black hole mass that's built into this? No, this is a model. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is a mo yeah. Sorry, thanks for for uh, yeah. This is a model. The um, the predictions uh, are uh, um, are wildly different at the moment because we have no data there. The region where we have data, it's up here. So whichever model uh, you have to you can build. I mean. All these dotted curves here should stay the same because they are anchored to the Sloan, for instance, and to the Canal de France data and so forth. And what can happen is that uh, depending on the extrapolation of the luminosity function, this curve may be going like this, for instance. And so depending on the extrapolation, yes, we have a strong uh, range in the predictions. Chandra 
I mean, they're the most intensely studied, I think. Yeah. The, the, the other thing is that uh, the limitation is, uh, is, the, um, is the area, essentially. Uh, again, um, these are uh, extrapolation uh, based on a specific model. This model, at the moment, uh, it's good in explaining uh, the observation, and also, it has been good in predicting observations that have been uh, uh, piling up uh, in, uh, in the subsequent years. But anyway, um, what you see here is that, uh, uh, for instance, this point here is the, is the four megasecond 